and we find ourselves, for those who have missed a, a class, right in the heart of the Haggadah's telling of the story, which I remind you is told through four verses. The Haggadah chooses to tell the story of the Exodus through four verses in Deuteronomy and uses Midrash. Midrash is, the fancy word is hermeneutics, but the, 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 the word you'll be more familiar to is just analysis and analyzes each word of those four verses to um, understand what lessons of the Exodus we ought to remember today. That's Midrash. What's interesting about the word, what's special about the word, sometimes Midrash translates the word into a different language, uh, into uh, Aramaic or into biblical Hebrew so that it's better understood. Sometimes Midrash compares the usage of a word in one section of the Bible with its usage in another section of the Bible in order to compare and contrast and maybe understand a deeper meaning to the word. And we've already seen that in our analysis of the first verse of the four. Last week, I'm pretty sure, we concluded the first of the, the Midrashim that were told on the first verse of the four. Uh, uh, and this is colloquially called Midrash Arami Oved Avi, right? The Midrash that is told on the four verses beginning with my ancestor was a wandering Aramean, right? Which the Haggadah we learned interprets as being a reference not to Abraham or Jacob, but a reference to who is the Aramean? It's Laban, right? Starting the story with spiritual degradation through the story of Laban and Jacob, right? And Laban's uh, desire to uh, destroy the Jewish people by inserting hatred and jealousy and rivalry into the early Jewish family, rather than starting the story with Abraham or Jacob in the sense of their homelessness being the start of the story, right? Homelessness is physical degradation, but the cheating and rivalry that Lavan inserts into the Jewish people is spiritual degradation. And that is a constant theme in the Haggadah, right? The two opinions, Rav of Shmuel, Rav and Shmuel, debating, discussing, disagreeing on how to tell the story. Where does Gnut degradation? When does it begin? Is it homelessness or is it uh, faithlessness, right? Or lack of Torah or lack of, um, or lack of identity or lack of home, right? So all of that uh, we addressed in the first verse. And isn't it remarkable how in the first verse with every word, I hope you saw that, with every word, the Haggadah tells a story. Did we assimilate or did we not assimilate in Egypt? Well, the answer is yes and yes, right? Um, what was our experience like there? Did we benefit from the society? Did we stay distinct? All of these we talked about. And also the idea of ending up there in the first place. How did we... Uh, how did our ancestors leave the promised land? And, and, and one of the fundamental questions of the Haggadah, why did God command Jacob to leave Canaan and go down to Egypt, knowing what would happen there? Why would God command suffering and slavery and exile, right? So, we're, we're going to get back to all of those questions because they do resurface at later points in the Haggadah. 
But today we're going to devote ourselves to two, the second verse, maybe even the third of the four. So if you have your Haggadot with you, the second verse begins with Vayered. Sorry, that's the first verse. Vayareyu otanu hamitsrim. Do you, do you see that in your Haggadot? Yes? No. Oh. So in addressing this verse, before we, before we look word by word, uh, I want to talk about what is called gradualism in uh, the way we understand genocides and how violence typically works. Gradualism is the idea that, uh, specifically in the case of genocide, that when you analyze genocide, you find commonly, almost universally, that the process happens in stages, right? First you, first this, then this. You know, it's not just, you don't just exterminate a people or enslave them out of nowhere. Uh, if anyone has read about the history of the Holocaust, you know that this is very, very true when it comes to how we understand the Nazi campaign against the Jews. It began with libels and dehumanization, and which eventually led to ghettoization. You know, there's all, I'm not an expert in the different stages of the Shoah, but uh, the notion that uh, the extermination of the Jews just happened out of nowhere is nonsense. It began somewhere in a, uh, in a concerted uh, effort to um, win over popular approval for the extermination of the Jews. And that that, that required other steps before just death camps. And by the way, gradualism continues even after extermination, right? What is the final step? You've learned about the 10 stages of genocide. What is the final stage of the 10? Does anybody know? The final stage of genocide is denial. Right. Even after the extermination happens, one should expect further cruelty, more in, in, in many ways worse. And that is that all these you say that all these terrible things that you did never really happened. Right. And that's why many of our efforts today to preserve the memory of the Holocaust focus on Holocaust deniers focuses on Holocaust deniers because they re-inflict genocide even after, uh, even after the genocide has occurred. So that, that notion of gradualism is what I think we're going to find in the way the Haggadah or these verses tells the story. And remember, I've said all along, this is the greatest book, second greatest book. Part of the reason I keep saying that is because as we delve into it, you realize how this book, which is centuries and centuries old, uh, articulates ideas which, which have only become, which have become popular in intellectual circles today. And, you know, we look at we look at ideas like gradualism and even examine what the Holocaust looked like and see, hey, there was this precedent for these ideas, these thought, these thoughts, and the, and the precedents are are so similar. It's amazing how 
uh, we don't learn and, and how history repeats itself over and over again. So keeping in mind that um, theory of gradualism, I don't know if you call it a theory, but that idea that genocide, enslavement happens in stages. Let's look at how the second of the four verses tells the story transitioning from our experience, how we got down to Egypt and how we may even have thrived there. And now we tell the story of how things turned rotten, how they got bad there. Is this where we ended up? I'm, I'm my, or did we skip? Hold on, I think we may have skipped one. You know what? We skipped an important, we skipped an important um, word in the last verse. I realized that. Can we go one so, page earlier in the Haggadah? The word Barav. Barav. Varav is the last word in the first verse. Just to remind you, Vayered Mitzrayma, he went down to Egypt, talking about Jacob, Vayagor Sham Bimte Me'at, and dwelled there in small numbers, Vayhi Sham Legoy Gadol Atsum, became there a great nation, Atsum va Rav. Most Hagado translate Rav as numerous, but I want to, I want to just, uh, I don't want to forget about the important midrash that's told about that last two-letter word Rav. Okay, sorry, I, I forgot we didn't do that last word. Um, our previous discussion at the end of last class was about whether the Jews were assimilated in Egypt or how they kept their identities. And the truth is, we said, this the Haggadah almost says both, right? On one hand, we became a nation there. Well, becoming a nation means we, we were distinct. And that's clear in many, many Midrashim, whether it was by keeping our names, keeping our language, keeping our dress, we remained distinct there. But on the other hand, we prospered. Well, if you're completely distinct, then you're not going to prosper from the wealth of Egypt. So the emphasis on, on growth and prosperity also suggests that a people that was separate participated integral, integrally in Egyptian culture and Egyptian life. But what about this word varav? Let's look at what the Midrash says on that word. Kamash ne'emar, as it is written, Revava. Okay, so sometimes a midrash will take a word and find, I actually said this earlier in the class, find another place in the Tanakh, in the Bible, where that word is used and say that the usage in that section must inform our understanding of its usage in this section. Revava ketsemach hasadeh Netaticha. Are you with me? Revava. I made you as numerous as the growths of the field. This is a verse taken from Ezekiel chapter 16. As numerous as the growths of the field. You then grew vatirbi, vatigdeli, Vatavoi baadi adayim shadayim nachonu usarech tsimeach the at arom the area. You grew and matured and became charming and beautiful a figure with your hair long and you were naked and exposed. Before we deal with the fact that it doesn't end there, there's a whole other problem here with this section, but let's first start with this. Let's first start with this verse. This is from Ezekiel. 
the word rav, which in the in its context here in this usage means what's rav? Rabim just means there you became many, right? But the Midrash is telling us that Rav points to something else, not just numbers. It points to a usage in Ezekiel where the word Revava is connected to, it sounds like wheat in a field. Ketsema Hatsadeh, the growths of the field. What is uh, the problem with wheat? So think about what the Midrash is saying. Yeah, you became big, but you were like wheat in the field. What's the problem? What, what does that mean? What do you think the Midrash is saying? Big in the sense of wheat in the field. Yes, Marlene. Very good. Wheat is vulnerable. Dominant. Remember the whole problem with wheat. Okay, we don't remember this, but because we live in a in a world of supermarkets, but um, wheat was the main uh, plant of the Fertile Crescent, which includes Egypt, which is probably where wheat originated from, right? And it includes Israel as well. The problem with wheat is that it is a very, very vulnerable grain. When there is bad weather, when the soil isn't right, you have a famine. And remember, the whole story of us ending down in Egypt was because of a famine. This is why, by the way, some people say we have a custom of having potatoes on our on our. Uh, Seder plates for karpas. Some people use a potato for karpas. Why? Because potato, unlike wheat, is reliable. More reliable because it grows in the ground, not exposed above the ground. So this, to, in my mind, is just a beautiful midrash that, that informs us about the vulnerability of our presence in Egypt that isn't muvan me'alav. It's not obvious from the word rav. Rav just means many, plentiful. But what Ezekiel says here is, yeah, you were plentiful, but you were vulnerable. You were exposed. Why? Because you were different? Because you were homeless? You were guests in somebody else's land. And when the wind blows this way, you'll tilt that way. And, that, and when it blows the other way, you'll need to tilt that way too. And in fact, that is specifically mentioned in this verse. That's why it's such a great midrash. Yeah, you were beautiful and charming and your hair was long. In other words, you look at yourselves in the mirror and say, boy, it's great to be Jewish in Egypt. But you were naked and exposed. The Ata Erom the Erya. Nothing was protecting you. Isn't that fascinating? The Midrash that this, this first verse ends saying. You did well in Egypt. You started out in very small numbers. You grew. Life was great. The problem is you were defenseless. We talk a lot today about the state of Israel. The fundamental purpose of the state of Israel is what? According to classical Zionists, right? Nothing else other than safety and protection. That's it. Everything else is fluff, <laughs> right? Preserving a Jewish homeland, fluff. Just, it all starts with protection. And remember the Haggadah is a fundamentally Zionist book. So the, the insistence at the end of the I won't say insistence, but the emphasis at the end of this first verse, which is the verse that leads us towards 
slavery, right? It's the last comment the Haggadah makes right before the Egyptians come and enslaves us is about vulnerability, right? You want to talk today about a theme that's very, very relevant in Jewish life? It's vulnerability. Being exposed. How, how thick should the walls be that we build? And what does it mean to feel safe and protected? Right? And are Jews vulnerable today? Right? It's a, it's a, it's a lesson that is timeless for Jewish survival, right? Both inside and outside of Israel. What vulnerability really means. Now in many Haggadot, the Midrash ends there. I wonder what your Haggadot, you've all come with different Haggadot. Do all of your Haggadot add a, a verse? After the word, and you were expo naked and exposed, Arum ve, what was the word? Arum ve erva, or arum ve erya. Do all of your do your Haggadot end there, or is there another verse after that? Of course. And you became numerous and excellent. You're fully grown. You have the those of you who've got the old one. Yellow. No, I'm not saying the cheap version. The yellow oh, Haggadah, which I grew up with as well. That's the old one. The it's, old version. The Goldberg Haggadah. It's yes. page 13 at the top of the page. Oh, yes. So page 13 at the top of the page ends there. Isn't that interesting? Yours ends there. It ends with Erom the Does any does everyone else's or does yours continue? Mine has another line. Ah, yours has another line. So does mine. Okay. Oh. So this is a very interesting. Half of the Haggadot end there. Probably that's the way it was originally. That was the end of the Midrash. And it's a perfect, perfect ending. Sometimes the way you tell whether one manuscript is right and one manuscript is wrong is not necessarily the dating of that manuscript, but just which one makes more sense. It makes much more sense given that the next verse begins with Vayareo Otanu Hamitzrim, which means they, they embittered our lives. It makes much more sense for the Midrash to end with we were vulnerable. Right? And then we start next verse with and they took advantage of that vulnerability. But in many Haggadot, they add the verse from Ezekiel that comes Right before, va'evor alaich va'erech mitposeset b'damayich. I passed over you and saw you wallowing in your blood, and I said to you, through your blood you shall gain life. Through your blood you shall gain life. This is a verse in Ezekiel from the same chapter. It does not have any connection to the word varav in it, which is more evidence that it is an addition to the original text. It's not original. But why do you think it is included here? Why would there be an emphasis to of blood? Why blood in, why add that to a section of the Haggadah that is about vulnerability and about being uh, and about being numerous. So what most scholars will tell you, the reason why this is there, and again, my, my view is this is not original and it was added, but it was too tempting for, given that we were quoting the verse just adjacent to it, it was too tempting for the Haggadah to ignore that verse. Why? I saw you wallowing in your blood, and I said, by your blood, you shall live. What's the first plague <laughs> of the 10 in Egypt, right? It's the plague of blood. The other thing that some commentaries will point to 
is this is a reference to circumcision. At the circumcision ceremony, the moel, after it's done, says, Va'omar lach chayi, chayi. This very verse is said by the moel at a circumcision. By your blood you shall live. Right? And that's because... Um, you know, it is, it is, has long been seen this first to be connected to circumcision, right? That we gain Jewish life or the life of the covenant through circ the circumcision ceremony. And the most important aspect of the circumcision ceremony is blood. Blood, as you know, plays a role, not just in the plagues of Egypt, not just in the circumcision, but in the salvation itself. Let's go back to one of our earlier, earlier classes. What was the whole, what was the whole Passover about? What did we do in order to merit being passed over? We painted some blood on our, on our, uh, in other words, blood, which the Christians really go to town with, right? But the, the idea of blood being a tool of salvation, it was probably just too tempting to ignore the verse right next door in ex it, it, when, you're, when you're quoting, right? When you're quoting it right here in the Haggadah and not in any other place, right? So it is a midrash that is out of place. There's no question. It, because I think sometimes we look at this verse as saying, oh, by your blood, you shall live. That's the blood of slavery. That's the suffering of slavery. And God said, I will redeem you. But that doesn't make sense. We haven't read any part of the, we're not enslaved yet in our story. We're going through four verses. This first verse, we're not enslaved yet. We're just vulnerable. So I think it's clear that this midrash is an addition, but sometimes even additional texts, you know, are too tempting to ignore. Yes, there was a, uh, Marcy, yeah. My translation starts with, and I passed over you and spied you speaking your blood. Is that in the answer? Yeah, the ayevor alayich. And I, pa exactly. So when this verse is right there and it says, vayavor alayich also, I passed over you. It's too tempting to, to ignore and leave behind. Yeah, right? The question is when they talk about the numbers, we know that I don't have uh, the, the passage in front of me, but when they leave Israel, when they leave, when they leave yes. Many of them. Yeah. They leave in a mixed multitude, yes. Yeah. So with mixed multitude, the question is, is the mixed multitude, I just want to repeat it for those who are joining online. Not yet. The numerous mixed multitude that leaves Egypt, you're correct, but we're not there yet. The, the numbers are meant to convey a sense of vulnerability. Right? Only when, you know, I, there's so many comparisons to the Holocaust here. Um, Hitler wouldn't have cared about the Jews if we were small and uninfluential. And he would not have been successful in his campaign of uh, inciting hate against them. Right? It was the fact that Jews became numerous and prospered and influential that was connected integrally with their vulnerability and um, that sense of being exposed, right? And that um, goes back further because when we spend the classes on the beginning of Christianity and, and when one of the problems was that Jews were attracting people to, uh, people were converting to Judaism. And so we became competitors. Right, so your point is success breeds jealousy, hatred, and that's what the Haggadah is saying. That's what the Haggadah is saying. You know, you benefited 
from Egyptian society. That's what's, we miss this part of the Haggadah. You know, we're so focused on, yes, today we are slaves in the land of Egypt. But there's, in this one verse, such an interesting story to tell about how that happened. Did slavery just come out of nowhere? No, what contributed to it? It was the fact that we became successful there, that we grew in number, which not only made us vulnerable um, in terms of our participation in the Egyptian economic project, right? But it also made us threatening. How could a group of people uh, so numerous, how can we trust them? since they have dual loyalty. They seemingly have loyalty to something else, not just the things that we as Egyptians have loyalty to. And that's why I didn't want to skip this word, revava. I think it's crucial, or varav. This word, which just means numerous. No, 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 the Midrash says that's a really important word. Revava is how we describe the wheat in the field. And while wheat symbolizes, as always symbolizes in Judaism, wealth and prosperity, that's not what the Haggadah goes with. It's wheat as a symbol of vulnerability, unreliability. Beautiful, beautiful connection and symbol. And then this additional verse, which some Haggadot quote and others don't, is just, as I said, too tempting to ignore because it's, it's really about such fundamental um, ideas, notions, concepts in the Exodus, like, like blood, like suffering, like redemption. Those are all themes in that adjacent verse. So too tempting to just ignore it. So now we can get to the second verse, which talks about the stages of genocide, how it begins. The first word is vayareu. It's a, a really interesting word. Reya can mean two things. There's two connections here to the word reya. Ra in Hebrew means uh, bad. Vayareu, they made us bad. Probably means they libeled against us. They um, re... They trying to think of a good verb for, well, let me look at my notes. Smeared. They smeared us. Wrong. So Merle says they dealt shrewdly with us. I don't like, mine says the same thing. I don't like that translation. Vayareu does not mean they... Ra means bad. Dealing shrewdly is a, is a whole other verb that's not there. Vayareu. Ra is the active verb to be, me, to be bad towards someone. They dealt wickedly, right? Because they're strugg your translation is struggling with what does that mean? They batted us, <laughs> right? It's a passive verb, vayareu. And, and I think the, the more appropriate translation, and, and I'm sad with your translation, Merle, because it, it misses the whole point. The, the whole point is they made us appear bad. How? They made us, that I like much more. They made us seem malevolent. Folks, how, the, this is why it's so important if you're actually going to study the Haggadah, right? 
that you compare different translations. And sometimes Merle's translation will be right on and mine will be wrong. I, I haven't yet found the Haggadah that, uh, that gets it right all the time. Right, and, and very often in this class, I'm saying, okay, here are three different explanations and they could all be right. And here actually, I have another explanation that could be, that could be correct. But the, the one I think I prefer, since when we talk about gradualism and the, stage of, and the stages of genocide, it often begins with a discussion of lying and smearing and blood libeling confusing people so they don't know the truth, right? It often begins with those notions and how appropriate that in beginning to describe the experience of our ancestors in Egypt, we begin with the same idea. They portrayed us as something that we were not. Vayareu, they made us appear wicked, bad. You know, how could a Jew not read this and get it and understand this? So why are Jews so concerned or why should we ought to be so, why ought we be so concerned when we watch things on TV and read things on Twitter and worry about a world that doesn't know the difference between truth and falsehood, a world that believes in your truth and my truth, <laughs> right? Or, or, and a world that, what was the famous word Trump used? There's a alternative facts, right? <laughs> uh, let's not go there. Let's not, but why does that worry people? Because when you start lying, that's how it all began, with lies, with alternative facts, making people appear as worse than they are. That's how you can manipulate people. In order to begin manipulating, you have to make people question their, their assumptions. You have to rob them of their certainty. You have to shake up their reality. If people you know, believe that uh, if people believe in the equality of, of their friend and, and have all of these notions of treating other people with dignity and, and with respect, you have to erase that. And how do you do it? Well, vayareu, that's the way you do it. You convince them through propaganda and lies that some people are different than others and in this case, inherently bad and wicked. So that's how the story begins, Vayareu. So that's the one I like, the interpretation I like. But there's one more that could be plausible that I like as well. Reya means friend. We say uh, in the Sheva Brachot, Sameach tesamach reim ha'ahuvim, reim ha'ahuvim. At the wedding ceremony, when you do the Sheva Brachot, you call the couple loving friends. Now, why could that also be true? And by the way, I think sometimes the Haggadah chooses that language because it does give those dual meanings. It's not our job to pick one or the other. It's our job to appreciate both. First, the Egyptians befriended us. First, they let us in. Then they turned against us, right? Which is also very true if you look at Jewish history and examples of genocides all over the world, right? First, they, they befriended us and then they turned against us. They're the ones who gave us access to the economic life of Egypt, and then after they gave us access, they became upset that we, that we did well. Whichever one you pick, I think there is truth. Vayareyu otanu hamitzrim. What does the Midrash say? Kemash and Emar, as it says, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply 
And if perchance we are at war, they will join forces with our enemies and fight against us, and we will be forced to leave this land. What is the Midrash telling us here about the Egyptian rationale for libeling the Jews, if we go with that explanation? What is the reason why they started this campaign to make them appear evil? This is why I think the first translation is probably correct, right? They made them appear wicked versus they befriended them. It's because of the Midrash that says they saw them as a threat. Which in itself is a smear, right? A threat against what? They were threatened that they would that the Israelites would join against the Egyptians if an outside enemy ever attacked. That was the that was the libel campaign that they launched against the Jews. In other words, they didn't do anything yet. <laughs> There's nothing that they did that would uh, that would lead us to rationally want to enslave them. But maybe they could do, maybe they, did, they would do this in this situation, right? It was, it's all nonsense. It's all make-believe, which is why I think Vayareyu has to mean they began with a smear campaign, with libel, with lies. Yes, uh, Marlene, you had your hand up. Goes back to the the, um, the present question of dual loyalty. Right. Yes, it deals very. I, I think that that's a correct. That's a that's a very good point, right? It deals directly with the question of dual loyalty. Dual loyalty isn't, um, or or I should say that the major uh, attack against the Jews from those who use dual loyalty to. Um, instill fear in the public is not that we will, it's not that we have sided against America, it's that we will. We might. It's that we might. And Jews are only loyal to America up to a point, right? But if an outside enemy comes in, we will show our true, our true colors, right? So it, it's not just dual loyalty, it's also um, the elders of Zion and, and all these other, the Jews want to control everything. They, they don't really have our interests at, at heart. They are loyal to something else. That's what it means. They launched a campaign against us based on the idea that the Jews were loyal to something else, they would be loyal to something else over Egypt. Isn't it amazing that, the, that this is how the Haggadah reads the story of our enslavement in Egypt in light of everything we know about anti-Semitism through the years, and it's spot on, spot on. What is anti-Semitism? Anti-Semitism is not Jew hatred. It is a, it is a, it is a ridiculous notion that Jews uh, secretly want, are controlling power. And that's what this is, this, that's what this is referring to. They won't be loyal to Egypt. They are only loyal to themselves. And at the end of the day, they're only looking out for their own welfare, not ours. This is how the stages of uh, the stages of uh, genocide begin with lies. So I think in your seders, this could provoke a really interesting discussion about, I think, what is today probably the greatest threat to democracy that exists, which is the manipulation of facts. How is this whole war against Ukraine being fueled by Russia? It's because Putin is lying about what he's doing. He's telling his own people. What did, what did he say? We're, I'm in a denazification campaign. 
It all starts with lies. Talk about every major world conflict. You, as much as we want to say, no, there's a real reason. <laughs> yeah, there's a real reason, but it, that real reason would never have been sufficient for the campaign to be successful. It had to be, it had to be accompanied by a vilification campaign, by, by uh, lies to influence people and, and make them believe things that are not true in order, to, um, in order to keep adding fuel to the fire. Whatever it takes, whatever lies, whatever nonsense you want to spew, and, and really, I believe that today, this is a tremendous threat to, to democracy. Uh, there's a lot of liars out there who are, right, who want to protect people from knowing too much. And, you know, remember what the Haggadah says. This is the wise child has to have his answers to his questions. Okay. And then how does, how does it continue? They afflicted us. But what does, how is affliction different than vayareyu? So we need the Midrash here to tell us. Anoto, the word in Hebrew, anoto, is chosen in this verse because it's close to vaya'anunu. It's the same root letters. So what does vaya'anunu mean? They oppressed them to oppress, and they built storehouse cities for Pharaoh, Pitom, and Ramses. La anot vaya anunu. I would actually not describe as oppress, but suffer. La anot in Hebrew still today is to cause somebody to suffer. Inui. First genocide begins with lies, then it begins with suffering. Suffering does not necessarily mean what you think it means, as in. They made them slaves. That's not what it says. It says they set task enforcers over them. Does that mean they are enslaved? It could. Sare misim, mas in Hebrew means what? Anyone know? Got to pay your, your taxes. Sare misim. Put task, ta sorry, tax <laughs> masters, not just task masters. So there could be in this interpretation, um, I think, a statement of how the Jews were humiliated before they became oppressed by, uh, by slave labor. This is also very, very common in, in Jewish history, right? Jews had to pay a special tax. And there was a special department that handled the taxes that the Jews had to pay. In the Muslim world, this was very common. Jews had to pay a head tax in order to live in, in Muslim countries, right? So Sarenisim, maybe it means that they were humiliated by being differentiated in society. Differentiation can mean having to wear special clothes. It can mean having to wear, having to pay special taxes. It can mean um, segregating them so that they can't do some jobs, but can do the others. And notice what, Notice how this Midrash concludes. So first of all, they were humiliated by having to do things that nobody else had to do. Did we sign out, uh, Daniel? We're okay. So they were, were humiliated by having to do things that others don't have to do. And we built storehouses for Pharaoh. 
the obsession um, in Egyptian society with the physical is very, very well known. Um, storehouse cities for Pharaoh, Pitom, and Ramses. If you, if you, you know, what remains of Egypt today, it's all their buildings, <laughs> which could, you know, still today cannot compare with the material accomplishments of pretty much any other society. Nobody built like the Egyptians built. On one hand, you can look at this Midrash and say, yeah, the Jews, they exploited the Jews in order to help build their cities. But I think there's a deeper, there's a deeper message here this, mess, this Midrash is trying to tell. How did they oppress the Jews? It was that they took their taxes in addition to their eventually to their labor, right? But they took their wealth and wasted it on a bunch of storehouses, building cities. There is a comment here, I think, about the materialism of Egyptian life to which the Jews were seen to... Um, to be able to contribute to. I don't know if you've read this, this, this book a few years ago on the Holocaust called Black Earth by Tim Snyder. Tim Snyder is probably the best modern historian out there today. I think he's a professor at Yale. But he wrote this book about the black, uh, called Black Earth about the Holocaust. And it was a very controversial book when it came out because it talks about the Holocaust, and really the whole Nazi pursuit fundamentally being about resources. And, and ironically, by the way, the role of Ukraine in, what did the Germans, what is Ukraine called? The breadbasket of Europe. What the Germans wanted to do was enslave the East, this is right, the story of, they wanted to exterminate the Jews, but before they did that, they were going to use them for slave labor. And the Poles also for slave labor, and the Russians also for slave labor. And the master race will, the master will benefit from the slave labor of the sub races so that the control, the ultimate control of limited resources will belong to the master race. And, and Timothy Snyder's book, which is a very long book, but definitely worth a read if you're interested in the Holocaust, articulates that this was Hitler's primary goal. For him, it was about conquering the East so that Germany would never have, would dominate the world by having access to resources, the basics bread. When I read that book and then compared it to this verse, which talks about storehouses and what are storehouses for? It's, not, it's for grain, right? I finally understood what this Midrash was trying to tell. Do I think it's Putin's? I don't think Putin has so much land. I think for Putin, it's more complicated. I, apparently for him, it's about, uh, I'm not an expert in this, but apparently for him, it's about Ukraine and its historic connections to ethnic Russia, right? But, but certainly in, in Tim Snyder's version of the history of, of, uh, of the Second World War, that is the role that Ukraine plays. It is a fight over control of resources and the Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe and that's what Hitler is really after, right? The Jews become, in, in addition to Hitler's campaign of extermination, there's another campaign that he launches against the Jews and that is enslavement, right? He enslaves the Jews 
so that they become tools in an economic campaign to control the resources of Eastern Europe. Uh, when I read that and started comparing it to this Midrash, you know, it, it clicked for me what this Midrash was trying to say. It's not that the Jews were enslaved. We know, the Midrash doesn't need to say that, it's obvious. The Midrash is digging deeper and asking, what is it that led to our enslavement? The first thing we said, Vayareyu, is they were, it was an accusation of dual loyalty, right? A negative perception of Jews that they ultimately would not be loyal to, um, to Egypt. But that, that's never sufficient. We know enough about Egypt to know that that's not what, what could sufficiently drive a nation to enslave an entire massive Jewish population, right? There had to be something else. What else did they want from us? And I think that's what this Midrash is talking about. The Egyptians wanted control. They wanted dominance. They wanted control over resources. That was their project. Pitom and Ramses were storehouse cities to put grain in so that Egypt, grain was is equivalent of a treasury. It's money. The whole well-being of a country depends on how much money you have in the bank. And the Jews became a tool in ensuring Egyptian prosperity, material prosperity. Um, and I saw another exhibit uh, a few years ago about ancient Egypt and just how much of their life involved gr cultivating grain. You were born and you, and you worked the fields and you die having worked the fields, right? That was what life was in Egypt. Uh, that's, you know, the, the importance of the Nile and how it feeds all of the, uh, all of the grain. Yes, Marcy. Isn't there an incredible irony there when we turn to our issue? If that's what the initial success of Joseph was, he built strong. Right. The irony of, of Joseph's success plays very much into this story. What did Joseph do that was so great that dessert, he interpreted a dream? That's why he, you be, that's all you have to do to become the second in command to Pharaoh is just interpret a dream. If you think that's what he did, you've missed the whole point of the story. This was a culture obsessed with money, obsessed with materialism, and Joseph made them rich. That's what, that's what the story is. He was appointed over Egypt as a tool in their economic prosperity, right? He saw something, you know, he basically worked out their budget so that Egypt would be successful. And that's how he became viceroy over Egypt. So it fits, doesn't it, very well with this story. It wasn't just a smear campaign against, against the Jews. It wasn't just that we were afraid they would side with our enemies. It's that we have a goal as Egyptians to become wealthy and prosperous. And the Jews can play a role for us in achieving that goal. We can use them. Let's just make them, let's set taskmasters over them. Let's use their, their money, their grain to uh, uh, cultivate as much wheat as possible to build storehouse cities for it and, and we'll become wealthy through them. Yeah, Daniel. I think what really clicked for me was that I always thought, well, how did they suddenly decide to make the, the Hebrew slaves but then I read that uh, the ancient uh, Egyptians used to tax the farmers with labor or with grain. So if they did a special tax on the Hebrews, right, then, well, now they have to do the labor. And there's a very small step between this special tax and slavery. Right, right. Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. 
I don't know if everyone heard online what Daniel was saying, but that's a, that's a fascinating point that the Egyptians task, it relates to this Midrash very much, right? Sarei Misim, they, they, they imposed forced taxes on the people you're saying, but taxes were not paid in, in dollars or lira, they were paid in grain. And the line between enslaving, taxing people, right, and enslaving them is narrower than you think. At a certain point, doesn't taxation become slavery? If you have to pay, I mean, ask the NDP. Does At a certain point, if all of your work is going towards the Egyptian coffers, right, then it is enslavement. Yes, uh, your hand, Art. When I took economics in my MBA program, that's exactly what I learned. The definition of a slave is an employee whose income is taxed at 100 <laughs> Right. That's so interesting. I never thought of that before. So Art's point is the definition of a slave is somebody whose taxation rate reaches 100%, right? You, we don't think about that, but there's a lot of truth, right? It just means all of your work, all of the fruits of your labor go to somebody else. The economic foundation of, um, of the Egyptian society which le and, the, and the obsession with material wealth and the role it played in the slavery of our ancestors is, is an important topic in the Haggadah. It sort of stops and calls our attention to what we were there to actually do. Storehouse cities, right? It's it's right there. If you just pause and uh, when I, you know, when I when this all clicked for me, it's how did I miss this? It's specifically storehouse cities. It's basically saying you just we needed you to build some places to put our money. And how the how the Jews became a tool for that, and how and how you know, as I said in Black Earth, how the Nazis planned to use. Slavs and Poles to do the same thing for them. And how society can get carried away. How easy it is for us to get carried away with, with the idea that wealth generation is going to make people happy or is what our, is our fundamental goal. How do you measure the prosperity of a country? Most people will say, GDP, the richer it is, the better it is. And yet, you know, there's a real, what is the danger there? Well, you might, the, a country might be very rich. The people might have money, but are they happy? You know, are, are they ruining the earth? Are we ruining the planet by constantly drilling for resources and and we might be making ourselves wealthy for now, but what are we doing long-term? And so I think there's a real movement today in, in the world to re-examine wealth generation as being, the, as being the first and fundamental goal of, of, measuring, uh, of measuring the health of a country. There are other things that matter too. You know, it... it um, I think it's a very important comment the Haggadah makes about the danger of material pursuit without temperance, without any counterbalancing force. If all you care about is the wealth and prosperity of your country, you will end up enslaving people. Yes, uh, someone's hand was up. Marcia. Yeah. Yeah. Two issues that came up. One was that uh, the backbone of the country was the farmers, and they saw their kids. This is where, when you were in Egypt, you saw that the backbone of the country were still the farmers, right? And they were their kids. They weren't sending them to school. They were and the, it were very good. And kids were not going to school. They were in the fields. And then what happened was that they they decreased the subsidy to 
buy bread. And that was the that was what caused the revolution. And the Egyptian revolution was caused by decreasing the subsidies to buy bread. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's interesting how the how you know these boring kinds of economic factors that we tend to overlook cause revolutions in countries. Amazing how bread and potatoes can cause rev revolutions in countries. What was it in Israel a few years ago that brought out thousands of people to the street? I think it was the price of cottage cheese, right? And or just the price of, re of regular groceries. So the way we see material welfare and how important it is in the, in, in the, in the functioning of a society, I think is being highlighted here in the Haggadah. We have to tell that story too. The way we can, the way economic pursuits lead to slavery. And wasn't that also what happened when he claimed for Stalin? How he took away all the grain? Yes, yeah, yeah. How Stalin took away the grain and then all. Okay, very good. Yes. And just to show how absolutely universal this all is. Yeah. And it's so sobering, you know, it's growing up in a privileged white in South Africa. The only reason that I was able to have a privileged white lifestyle was because of the enslavement of... It was so interesting, America. right? You're, it, it, the comment about how much this relates to you as, as someone who knows about how the South African economy worked, right? We're, the whites were able to have a, a good lifestyle because the blacks were doing work for them at slave at labor at 100% taxation exactly right That's amazing how much how how this theme continues to play itself out and it is there in the haggadah as a warning to us the egyptians got carried away with their materialism and the jews may not have even been their primary anti-Semitism may not have been the primary motivator here. Jews were just exposed, vulnerable, and convenient to help, to help um, fuel Egyptian economic growth. How are we? I have five minutes. Let's just do one more word. Avoda kasha. So that was vaya anunu. Humiliation, debasement, using the Jews as a tool in uh, in the in national economic prosperity, and now vayitnu aleinu avodah kasha kemoshen emar vayavidu mitzrayim ebnei Yisrael befareh. The Egyptians enslaved the children of Israel with back-breaking work. Now we're at again gradualism. Anti it starts with anti-Semitism. Then it starts with fueling a camp. Then it starts with um, getting people obsessed with material prosperity at all costs. And it ends with avoda kasha. This is not just avoda. Avoda means labor. Avoda kasha means back-breaking work. Help me understand backbreaking. Befarech, right? My Haggadah translates befarech as backbreaking work. What do you think the Haggadah is trying to tell us? Again, it's not trying to tell us we were enslaved. We already know we were enslaved. There's an additional element here of that slavery that the Haggadah is trying to tell us. Befarech, back breaking work, not just slavery, back breaking work. There is using people for slavery that using people for slavery that afflicts their body. And I would argue that this midrash is telling us the slavery that our ancestors endured in Egypt was not just to rob their not just to take use their physical um, abilities, but to torment them psychologically. Avoda, that's slavery, that's labor. Avoda kasha, 
slavery that would break them. That's deeper. The kind of labor that our ancestors endured was, was um, the kind that was intent on robbing them of their hope, robbing them of their dignity, a kind of work that would even rob them of their humanity. That's why I like the word backbreaking, because a person can't live when their back is broken. Right? You just have to lay in bed. You lose your humanity. So to make them work bafarech is to turn them into a machine. It's to say, you can't be human anymore. There is a difference between, I think a crucial difference between slavery and the kind of work that the Egyptians wanted to impose upon the Jews that later I think becomes very important as we talk about freedom and what freedom really means, right? And the notion that slavery didn't just harm our ancestors, right, for one generation, but it, it festered on and on because the kind of work that they were exposed to was the kind of work that no human could endure and remain human. It was backbreaking work, the work that machines do. And they just became tools in building the wealth of Egypt. Yes, Marcy. One of the explanations we have here is that it was a grinding work with that end, born in the hope not only from wanting to enslave them, but in the hopes of grinding down there you their go. Hearts. Grinding down their hearts. Grinding down their hearts. So, so I like your hug. Which Haggadah is that? It's Nathan English. Nathan English. That's the new American Haggadah. So beautiful. So far, I like your Haggadah. I don't have a copy of it, but I like that uh, every, every comment that you've shared from that Haggadah has been true to what I think the, the real message is of the different Midrashim. They put work upon us that robbed us of our humanity, that changed who we were, right? Reminds me of all the stories that are told during the, sh during the show of taking away people's dignity, you know, forcing them to work in and do inhuman things. Right, that under normal circumstances you never would have done. And how easy it is to fall into that trap of looking at people and turning them into tools when all it is you care about is material well being. Pretty good book, eh? Haggadah is a pretty good book. Next week we'll keep going. This is a tale of the gradual descent into slavery, and then God's redemption in four verses. But you, you see how in each word, the Midrash brings out a deeper meaning. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thanks, thank everyone you. Who, thank was, you, uh, who was online. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question thank online. Okay, yes. Roz, you had a question? Oh, hi. Yes, I did. I just wanted a point of clarification. So they obviously, the Egyptians wanted to dehumanize the Jews and have them as a workforce, but they didn't want to exterminate them um, because this was, their, this was their powerhouse, right? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, the, the story that, well, I, I would disagree. So we're not there yet, but Roz's question is, we're making a lot of comparisons here to genocides and yeah. to the Holocaust, but the, did the Egyptians want to exterminate their workforce? No. So we're gonna get there next week, Roz. I think the question of extermination uh, does become relevant when we get into Pharaoh throwing the boys, remember, into the river. 
Mm. And um, we'll talk about people refusing to have children. So it may not be a concerted campaign with the goal of exterminating the Jewish people, but it gets very, very close. Very, very close. You'll see, if I can hold your attention just for one more week, I think you'll see how it gets very close, right? Like throwing babies into rivers. Rivers. Mm. Sounds like yeah, extra. Not nice. What's that? <laughs> not nice. I said not nice. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but you know what I'm saying? It's If that's not extermination, because you say, well, it's just the boys. <laughs> um, it's pretty close. Okay. It's pretty close. Well.